Hello and welcome to the Crush Your Mountain weekly podcast, Personal Growth. This episode, we're going to talk with J.R. Spears. He is a U.S. veteran, combat veteran, who experienced the trauma, the horrors of being blown up by a suicide bomber. We're going to learn about dealing with PTSD and how important it is to have the patience with anyone because we all have our personal trials, we all have our personal troubles, and you don't know what a person is going through. And things that triggered him are amazing. When you listen to the story, watch carefully, listen, learn. And I'll be back at the end of the program. So, so to all that are tuning in, to all that may tune in later, I want to extend a very warm welcome to this very special edition of Crush Your Mountain Personal Growth. We have with us an incredible individual. I had to introduce him to you because you and you understand exactly what he's been through, what he's going through now in order to make others grow. It's incredible. And this is a gentleman that I would say we can model in terms of crushing your mountain. Let me tell you a little bit about him. After experiencing the horror of a suicide bomber attack, this gentleman has overcome PTSD, survival guilt syndrome, and other challenges to become an entrepreneur. He's created four or more successful businesses ranging from fitness to marketing and consulting. He's the founder of Creed, the Creed Method. We're going to discuss a little bit about that. We're going to learn a little bit about his journey, his trials and his triumphs, and what we can do to become resilient in the face of daunting chaos. Let me introduce to you U.S. combat veteran, martial art expert, dynamic speaker, and businessman extraordinaire, Mr. J.R. Spears. Welcome to Crush Your Mouth. Thank Mountain. you so much. That was uh, definitely an impressive uh, introduction. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Well, I'll tell you something, you know, uh, just the service that you've done, you know, in itself is highly valued, you see. So we wanted to certainly acknowledge you for that. And we know it's a, it, it's, it's a tremendous, uh, it, it takes a tremendous person to experience those sort of things. So let's just jump right in. You know, you went through that situation. Could you just walk us through that, if you're comfortable telling us a little bit of, about your experience there serving in, the, in in Iraq and some of the challenges you dealt with it, uh, after that? Yeah, I mean, I could go back a lot sooner, but I'll just start right from uh, that day and kind of paint the picture for everyone. So, you know, first off, I want everyone to understand is like, you know, in, in war and in combat in Iraq, there's a lot of really great people in the Middle East that are just in a really bad situation. So not everyone that's Middle Eastern is bad. I want to make sure that everyone understands that because I met some amazing individuals while I was there. But just like here in the, in the United States or anywhere else in the world, there's a lot of bad people in a lot of bad places. So uh, during my experience in, in Iraq in 2007, uh, you know, I, I, we got there. We left for deployment on September 6th to, or September 13th, 2006. And uh, was there for about nine months. And I was a, a Navy chaplain's RP, or assistant. So I was security for the chaplain. So they called me RP. I was in the Navy, but I was attached to the Marine Corps. And I deployed with 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines on the 15th MU. And what a MU stands for is Marine Expeditionary Unit, where we bring a bunch of other types of, uh, how do I explain it to make it easier for everyone that don't, don't know, but a lot of bunch of other units and different types of people together to go perform one mission. Ultimately, is what we do. So we, uh, we landed in Iraq in September 2006, and it was very quiet when we, were, when we were there, not a whole lot going on. And, and the, the war that we were fighting in Iraq is very different than other wars that people study on, like Iwo Jima or um, you know, Vietnam or things like that, because we're pretty much fighting a ghost. It was always like IEDs or mortars or suicide bombings, things like that. We didn't really get a whole lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat, you know, fire face on or anything like that. It's very different. Now, stuff like that does happen, and it did happen while we were there. But for the most part, we're constantly fighting a ghost and didn't really know what was going on. And they're good weather fighters. So, I mean, they're not going to come out if it was raining or if it was bad weather or stuff like that. We knew that we were able to breathe a little bit and relax. So, but for the first part of our deployment, you know, it, it was it was pretty calm. We didn't really have a whole lot going on. And you're going to probably hear me say the word complacent many times throughout our conversation because 
one thing that we learned while we're over there is, and it's all over the port of Johns and on walls, anywhere you go saying complacency kills. And that is super important even inside of our businesses is the moment that you become complacent, even inside of your business, your business is going to die as well as, you know, the future dreams that you want to be able to build. So just always remember complacency kills because the second you get too comfortable is the second that you get to, you know, off guard and something bad could happen. So I woke up one morning on February 7th, 2007, and the night before on February 6th, me and the chaplain, we were out on a mission and late at night coming back from a, another city. So we, we got back to our main camp. It was probably, I don't know, I think it was probably like 11, 12, or maybe even later in the middle of the night and had to get up early for other things that we we're getting, getting ready to go do. And when I woke up, uh, you know, I think it was probably like five or 6 a.m. when I was supposed to meet the chaplain, wherever we're going, beautiful day sunny outside the wind was blowing i mean you couldn't ask for better weather and when I, but when i woke up it just something felt a hundred percent off already from the day from the time that i woke up step outside in the tent and didn't really know what was going on but it was just it just seemed like something you, you know just something just seems weird something just feels off that's kind of how it felt for me i was like what the heck is going on so i went over to the the plate there are you know kind of like our meeting room where i met the chaplain every single day and, and he wasn't there I was like, okay, you know, what's going on? Yeah, chaplain's not there. First off, chaplains are non-combatants, meaning they can't even carry a weapon for defense. So that's why they have me. So the chaplain isn't supposed to go anywhere at any time without me knowing or me by his side 100%. And because if anything happened to him at all, it's always going to be 100% my responsibility. So it, he wasn't at our, our scheduled time and in our meeting place. So I had a, I went around and was trying to figure out, okay, where the heck is the chaplain at? And, uh, you know, I got with Kam, I went with our first sergeant, he ended up going with our battalion first, our company CO, I'm sorry, our battalion CO and our battalion sergeant major out to the city and, and went on patrolling through the city with them, and which is definitely not allowed. I mean, he, he definitely put himself at risk and definitely put me at risk. So as you can see, the day is already starting off bad. I already had an ill feeling before I couldn't even find him. And now I got to find out where he's at and try to meet up with him. So he put both of us at risk. And um, so during this time, I ended up finding where he's at. I ended up getting with Calm to figure out, I was like, okay, how can I meet? Where Where's a good meeting place for us to be able to connect and get back together? And so there was a walking checkpoint down by the Euphrates River. So if anyone, if Bible scholars or anyone knows the, you know, a little bit about Father Abraham, the, you know, the, the Euphrates River and where the Euphrates and the Tigris River is where Father Abraham would walk up and down in the area. And that's kind of like where we were, were located. So I'm a man of faith. I, I believe in, in scripture. I believe in Christ as my savior. And every time I, I stepped, I got behind the wheel of a Humvee, I always prayed Psalm 91. And I memorized it and played it on my heart. And I always knew what to say when I went out there. And there's one key part in there that says, a thousand may fall on your side and 10,000 in your right hand, but they shall not come near you. And I end up, I memorized the entire verse at the time. I still know the majority of it and, and still speak it out. And it's a powerful verse. But every time I got behind the wheel of a Humvee, I always did that. So I ended up finding out where the chaplain was going to be, meet, where he was going to be meeting with the, the CO and the sergeant major down there. I got with Com and I found a convoy that was going to be going down there taking some supplies. So I ended up getting a Humvee, went with the convoy down to this uh, checkpoint and end up meeting them down there. Now at this checkpoint, this is where like it was a walking checkpoint. So we had a couple different checkpoints. There was one on the main road where cars that were coming in and out of the city that they got searched, make sure there's no danger. And then we had a walking checkpoint where anyone walking in and out of the city, which was close to the river, did the same thing. So to kind of paint the picture in this area, we had it burned up where it, it was kind of like a small little outpost you want to kind of think about. And then there was like, we had this building where we can go up on top of the roof to oversee like the, the city and the crowd and the river and, and just kind of have a good overview. So we had some shelter up there and stuff that, so if something would go down that we could protect ourselves. But then we have these husks down at the bottom, which is like these big fabric things filled with dirt. So if there was ever an explosion, it took the impact of the blast. And then in the center, we actually built a wall made out of those, uh, con like you see on the highway, you know, the concrete things right there that we stack up to separate the highway. We had that in the center of the walkway that separated people going in and out of the city. And we had an opening in the center right there. That's really the reason why I'm painting that picture, because that's important to really understand, to kind of know the setting of where I'm at. So I'm standing in the center where that walkway is uh, for, you know, staying with another Marine, you know, for probably 30 to 45 minutes. Our main job was honestly to provide morale support for the Marines and sailors that were there. 
And so if anything ever bad happened, we were there. Someone got injured, they got hurt, or just to kind of keep the morale up. So we always went to different FOBs, forward operating bases, where we actually had different Marines and outposts to go there, be with them, chaplain, and do a service. I always carried around a guitar. The funny thing was I always said my guitar in my left hand, my rifle in my right hand. So provided, you know, some, some music and stuff for the Marines when we were out there. But I'm standing at this walking checkpoint with this Marine for a long time. And uh, on the other, in, in, there was like this little, not, I can't say garden area, but there was this grass area between the building and, uh, and the, like this under, under sheltered area under the, before you go to the top of that building. But then there was this big grass area right there. And then another wall before you go to the other part where people were walking in and out of it. So the chaplain, I couldn't really see him. I didn't have good visuals, but he was in that grass area. And I couldn't really see where, where he was at. He was there with another Marine, but it was in a closed area. So I was like, okay. You know, if anything would happen, he'll be safe. He's behind shelter and there's other Marines over there. So I, I kind of knew where he was at. So he's over there doing his thing. I'm standing here with uh, another Marine and I get this nasty feeling in my gut that's saying, hey, move. And it was just telling me like, just move. And I was like, okay, what's going on? You know, it, I, I didn't respond to it. I had that feeling. And if you look at the Bible where, you know, people have these audible voices and they're saying, hey, you know, God's telling you something, you know, listen, and they didn't really know. Well, I really feel like this was the moment in my life where I had an audible voice, clear as day, telling me to move. And I didn't respond. I didn't really say anything. I didn't react. I just still hung out there. I was like, okay, whatever. I just ignored it. And then after a few more minutes went by, I hear that voice again saying move. And it was just, I, I had that pit in my stomach, wasn't really, wasn't really feeling well. And I couldn't really see a chaplain. I was like, okay, no, we're good. I'm looking around. I was like, okay, it's a nice day. People are, you know, everyone that's in a big line that's coming in, you know, they're set back and everyone's over there and I'm, I'm talking to locals and stuff like that. And it just seemed like a normal day. Everything was fine. And then, so that was happening the second time. About the third time is, you know, I, I hear it again, saying move, but almost at this point, I end up getting nauseous. I'm feeling fine. I had that pit in my stomach, but now I'm feeling nauseous. Like, man, I'm getting ready to throw up out of nowhere. I'm like, oh, shoot, I, I, I need to go. So I, I said bye to Corporal Emery, um, you know, the Marine that I was standing next to. As I was walking, I was going towards that grass area where the chaplain was at. My sergeant major, he was walking through that opening and almost meeting right where I was going, where that opening was that, that uh, you can see people going in and out of the city. I gave him a green, as we always do. Anytime you uh, walk by senior personnel, you always greet them. So I would always look up to him and be like, hey, good morning, Sergeant Major. He looked down at me. And with his, he has this really deep voice. And I still hear it today is saying RP and just really deep. I mean, he was a very influential person in my life and every Marine there. He was the Marine, the Marine getting ready to retire in a couple of months. And uh, at that moment, and I just had a lot of respect for this guy. And uh, as we cross paths, I go around the turn where that grass area and was walking right in front of where that opening, there was another guy coming in. And as he was walking in, he lifted his arms, strapped a C4 and blew himself up. I was staying feet away from this guy that, uh, you know, probably I, I don't even know 100% how, how far I was, maybe feet, seven feet, whatever, away from this guy that, that lifted his arms. We thought his mortars coming in. I was thrown left unconscious, knocked off my feet. And it was the biggest, you know, it was the biggest tragic event that happened in my life because at that moment, there was like smoke everywhere. I mean, everything was nothing but confusion, straight tunnel vision. Uh, my, you know, I was blown it took, took the impact on the right side of my body and I didn't know if I had limbs broken off I didn't know if I had my arm was blown or, or anything like that all I knew was I saw the chaplain on the ground and he was trying to crawl and I saw my uh, company first sergeant Gunny uh, over by the underneath that shelter area just kind of waving and I could barely see him everything was completely foggy if you would picture like Saving Private Ryan or another type of war movie where you got these bombs going off everywhere and there's just smoke everywhere and just complete chaos that was this day and I couldn't see that far in front of me. I couldn't hear anything. I just had straight ringing. The whole side of my right body was completely numb. I saw the chaplain crawling and my first sergeant, you know, kind of waving. So all I knew is I had to react and respond to what I was trained to do. So I grabbed my chaplain by the back of this flak and I could barely move. And I'm dragging him probably 25 to 50 yards underneath the shelter so we can assess the area and make sure that there was nothing else going on. Because at that moment, we didn't know what happened. We didn't know if it was a suicide bombing, if we didn't know if it was mortars coming in or what the heck uh, just took place. All we knew that something went down, something happened, and a lot of people were injured. So, so kind of paint the picture of how... Go ahead. Did, so, so did, did you have any further... Did you take any fire after that, or it was just the, the bomb at that point? It was just that one bombing. So right when that bomb took place, 
and they kind of paint the picture of how strong that blast was uh, a pack of cigarettes that probably came from the guy that killed himself there was a cigarette penetrated completely straight inside of the cloth hesco that was stuffed with dirt like probably a good half inch to an inch inside without the cigarette even being bent wow. so my sergeant major who i just walked by and he was staying right where i was at with uh, david emery he died at that blast that Marine that I was staying next to lost both of his legs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another Jennifer Purcell, who was further away, she ended up dying in the blast. Our interpreter, uh, Jimmy, he, uh, he ended up sacrificing his life during that time. And, uh, and there was a bunch of other injuries and, and, and things that took place at that moment. So the really, you know, e even though that was a very traumatic event in my life and what took place there, years later and it was probably over 10 years later I, I look back at it and just kind of reflect because honestly it's something that I think about every day it's not something that's like hey this is something that happened before and I forget about it this is an incidence and details that I talk about and I think about every single day of my life and the, and the images the smell and the feeling everything from that one day lives with me every single day and no but yeah what, seeing that you do that deal with that daily okay what practice do you do? Now, I, you know, I'm going to guess, first of all, you're pray, praying, which is absolutely vital. So after that, after the press, what uh, steps do you take to fortify your resilience to and, and move and continue to move forward the way you have? Yeah, there's a couple different things. Um, but first off, you know, people need to understand from the outside looking at me, I look like I'm completely normal. But as I am speaking to you right now, I still, I, I get the echo of my own voice on the right side of my face still today. Mm -hmm. every, every word that I speak, I get nothing but an echo and it's like a numbness on the side of my right ear. Mm -hmm. And they're still trying to figure out what's wrong with me. They think it's inner ear nerve damage. I have limited rotation with my right arm. So as I move my right arm, anytime I take it away from my body, it hurts completely. I do suffer a lot of PTSD. I do have a lot of external injuries in my back from the lack of movement in my arms. So there's a lot of things going on with me, ringing in my ear all the time, constant pain, 24 seven. So there's a lot that I have to deal with. So the, the so talking about the reminders and thinking about it, it's because of all the injuries that I still suffer and deal with on an everyday basis, reminds me of why I have those injuries. And that's why I think about it. But you bring up a really good question is how I able to cope. And, you know, the unfortunate part, a lot of, a lot of Marines and, and people that I served with, don't actually ever get, get rid of the demons. And I, I still live with the demons every single day. And, you know, they, I still lose people, not frequently, but people that I served with that was down there with me at the blast um, still take their own life. Even this past December, you know, a Marine that I would never, that we would never have thought um, would have done it, ended up taking his own life. And uh, um, the way that I cope with it and the way that I could, I try to teach anyone how to do it is first, there's two things. First, you got to have purpose. And second thing, you have to know your identity. You got to have a reason why you're getting up every single day to do what you want to do. If you don't have that purpose, you don't have that drive or that one thing that's so strong. And I'm not saying, you know, this is my purpose. I just have, a, I, I have a family and stuff like that because my buddy that just took his own life, he had a family, he had a kid on the way as well. And another kid, so he had a child, he was married, beautiful family, had another child on the way. And this guy is one that always had smiles on his face and everything like that. And, and unfortunately, that's always the, the typical story. But if you don't have purpose and, and something that's so strong, that's that's a fire that's burning inside of you to get to 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 have you get up and do what you do every single day, it's going to be really hard to be able to win this fight. And it's a fight, though. I mean, if you look at people from the, the Vietnam War, I mean, think about the the life that they have and what they go through. I mean, I can honestly relate to almost everything that they that they went to because there's constant demons and stories and flashbacks and everything just kind of reminds you of that. The second part is your identity. You, you got to really understand of who you are and what you want people to know you as. Yes, I'm a combat veteran, but first off, I'm a Christian. I'm a father. I'm a husband and I'm a business owner. And I have a lot of people that depend on me. And so there's a there's if you don't have that purpose, and that identity and have a clear vision for all that, it's really hard to get up to be able to crush her every single day and to do what you got to get done. That's amazing. One of the businesses that you formed was a fitness business. You know, that was that based around your ex, your martial arts expertise? Yeah. So I grew up in, in the fit in a family owned business. And it was always the martial arts and fitness space. So I started martial arts when I was three years old. 
Yeah, my, my mom. Yeah, I got four sisters. My mom's always owned a business out of St. Louis, Missouri. And to me, that was just second nature. I mean, I, you know, went to school and then I went right when I got out of school, I went to the martial arts school and I did that every mm-hmm. single day of my life. And I didn't know any different. That was just my everyday life. Uh, so went to the martial arts school and I've been teaching since I was 12 years old. And then even in high school, I had def- the amazing opportunities to travel around to a lot of different places of teaching on self-defense, data awareness, um, how to actually teach classes, all these different things, even while I was in high school to other instructors my peers and uh, other places. So I was very fortunate when it came to that. And then, so when I got out and back from Iraq, I had like less than 30 days. I got back from deployment May 31st of 2007. And I was out the beginning that first week of July and was, and I was going to, I knew I was going to Bible school. So uh, I got back uh, July and I moved to St. Louis right after that. I live in Northern Virginia now, but I moved to sit back to St. Louis where my, my, my family is and was, I was going to Bible school and I needed to figure out what I was going to do with myself. Well, at that moment, I knew I didn't want to work for anyone. So I was like, okay, well, I know how to teach martial arts. So why not teach martial arts? So I started a program, built, and, you know, you know, rented some space, started teaching some classes, and then uh, hired my first business coach. And that was the huge pivotal moment in my life was hiring that coach. Um, after he taught me so many things that I still implement today, that I still teach, that I still use to effectively help me build my businesses. But I, after a few years, I sold the martial arts school and built a group fitness, like a high intensity training boot camp business. And I launched it to three different cities where I was in St. Louis, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Hmm. And I know it's really random. The reason why I moved to the Carolinas that had it is because I had a Marine that that found me and reached out and was like, Hey, I just got certified in personal training and I want to teach classes. And I was like, all right, well, I wasn't planning on expanding out this way, but let's do it. So dude, I'm in North Carolina. So Thanks for coming. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love the Carolinas. I mean, um, I had a good run about eight to 10 years and I shut the doors when we moved to Virginia from St. Louis. Mm-hmm. And I honestly, I went through in 2015, I went through a lot of uh, depression and just kind of a, a lot of demons I was fighting, a lot of things I was, I was, I was, you know, coming against me. And I literally shut the business down overnight. I just like hit the red button, contacted all my clients. I had hundreds of clients, tons of instructors, more than 30, 40 locations where I had classes going on. And I said, hey, it's been a fun ride, but I'm done. And then just shut it down overnight. And I, I, I kicked myself in the butt for that because I had a really good thing going on and uh, just the thriving business. I love the community. I miss it tremendously, but um, it, it was time for that. Well, there's, there's a point that you have to come back into yourself, so to speak. Okay. Yeah. And what I found interesting, just working with many of the clients that I work with, um, some of them come from a place of dealing with intense experience like yours. Some of them come from experiences that were not as intense, but prolonged and sustained. Well, Mm -hmm. in either one of those cases, what happens is they'll reach a point where maybe those emotions that are untapped or this just kind of still there, they kind of well up. And that's when you have to take your time and sit back. You're going to have to go, okay, Steve, we, 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 we've been um, doing some Bible references. I'm going to throw one at you myself. We're going to have to do an Elijah. We're going to have to walk through the wilderness a little bit, you know, yeah. you know and, and take that time. You see what I'm saying? Maybe let the crows feed us, right? But yeah. the idea, though, is taking the time and you know, re, re, kind of rewinding, resetting. You see what I'm saying? And if you have to do anything to shut that the business down, what have you, you're doing that in order to come back better. You see yeah. what I'm saying? You know, if you don't take time to heal yourself, if you don't take time to be what you need to be for yourself then what do you have to give to others, right? Absolutely. And I think when I went through a lot of that depression is actually the year that I started seeking counseling while I was living in St. Louis yeah. and was seeing a specialist uh, at the VA that, that focused on PTSD. And it was, at the, it was up until that time that I, I completely blocked everything away. Mm-hmm. Didn't really think about it much. It was always just in the back of the head. It's like, oh yeah, this happened, but I never really dealt with it. And my wife at the time, she was like, 
it was probably a year prior. She's like, why don't you, why don't you go ask her help? I mean, cause I was completely, and I was like, Oh, I'm completely fine. And, but I would, I would like, I was almost like bipolar where I would just hit this rage for no reason at all. I mean, I, 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 I was like that, the person was, I was just click off really quick and do it. And I'll never forget this moment shortly after. So I got back 2007, we got married in 2009. And when we first got married, we were downtown at an event in St. Louis and, um, and at, at, at the moment, like it was, they had a band playing, there was a bunch going on and I already didn't do well with crowds and just always get anxiety just because I always have to assess and know what's going on. But then right across the street, they started shooting off fireworks like in, in there. And when they, but it wasn't like it was at a distance. It was like literally the building that was probably 50 feet away from me. They shot fireworks off. I, you have to understand my job. I, I was security for the chaplain. I was trained to protect. I threw my wife to the ground and pretty much, you know, secure the whole area in a big circle of everyone that around me getting ready to kill anyone that came near me. Because all I, all I thought was I was in combat and something was going on. Immediately and, and, go back to that. Sleep. Oh yeah. I, I threw, I threw her to the ground and she didn't know what was going on. I just like, I just remember grabbing her, throwing her to the ground, just like stood there and just like assessed the area and what was going on and like made a big circle around me. Like no one, no one's getting close. And everyone just looked at me like I was crazy. Just freaked out. I mean, I was freaked. I didn't really know what was going on. All I knew was like, what the heck is going on and straight tunnel vision. Couldn't really see her. What was, what was, what was moving. And I was just remember being getting back to the truck and just wide as a ghost. I was like, what? And just couldn't breathe and just didn't know. So my wife at the time, you know, it was definitely a few years later and where she was like, uh, why, why don't you just go get checked? Why don't you just go there? And I was still in denial. I was like, oh, I'm fine. You know, no, there's nothing wrong with me. And I was always very active. I was doing triathlons. I was you know, teaching. I had a great life and beautiful community that I built up. And um, and I went to go get checked. And, and when I did that, the first several months of me going in and sitting with the doctor, I had literally sat in that chair, looked at the doctor for the hour I was sitting there and didn't say a word. But after a few months, I started opening it up a little bit here and there. But when I started to do it, it started bringing everything to the surface. Right. And then I started remembering details and remembering instances. I would be smelling everything like I used to. Like, I, like there's certain smells that just make me nauseous and sick, like anything burning, like burnt plastic or whatever it may be. I mean, I had moments where I was at an event uh, in downtown St. Louis and I go back to the parking garage by myself. And I, I stopped like a hundred feet away from my, my car and in the garage. And I am just standing there stuck. My feet are like glued to the ground and I am drenched in sweat and having straight panic attack and anxiety and just couldn't move. It took me everything to get to that car. Cause you have to understand, as I said, every time I got behind the wheel of a Humvee, it was the most terrifying thing you can imagine. Cause you didn't know if you were going to hit an IED or, or, and get blown up that day. So getting inside, like walking up to my vehicle is like, I had to talk myself through this process of you know it's safe it's okay kind of looking around but i just never forget like that was one huge anxiety attack i had in the middle of this garage had my guitar in my hand because i was playing in in the worship team at that time and it was at an event and i just couldn't move and i was just i was just stuck and um so there was a lot of instances like that but seeing the counselor definitely helped me tremendously and even even you know taking the time to share this right now it took me more than 10 plus years to even start sharing my story to the public and just because it's not because I couldn't do it is because I didn't feel worthy enough to do it. You know, I had my sergeant major that died. I had another Marine that lost his legs and then all these other people and people look at me and think I'm hundred percent fine. It's like, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. What, what, what do you got to share? And yet they, they don't see everything that I have to deal with on a regular basis. Yeah. You know, this is you know, a mental health month, national mental health month. And one of the things that's happening with the company that I, that I work with, you might call it the day job, so to speak. Okay. And my own company that's in terms of dealing with, with uh, clients one-on-one uh, -on -one, is that which I try to help individuals get past the stigma of the challenges because we are all in this situation where we have something that we deal with. And Unfortunately, would you agree with me that sometimes the world can be a little, um, there's a lack of understanding there. And so one of the things I would, I would wonder about is in spite of all that, in spite of all the challenges, of course, this just speaks to your resilience. And that's what I want to touch on. You still founded your, your, your for instance, martial arts school. And by the way, which 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 martial art? I, I didn't get that one. Is it karate? Yeah, so I 
Yeah, so I started out in uh, Bushido Shonryu Karate, and then I've done a lot over the years. I, then I went to Olympic style Taekwondo, done Kaji Kimbo, American kickboxing, and Judo, and um, a bunch of different things. But I mean, you can kind of say we were mixed martial arts, but foundations was Olympic style Taekwondo. Okay, wow. Okay, so you started the, the martial arts school, then you moved into the fitness. Okay, and then you dealt with that challenge, but you just you came back in a stronger way by founding the marketing company could you tell me a little bit about that yeah so there's actually another business that i had afterwards so when after i shut down the the boot camp business when we moved to virginia i started a franchise for a publication for our community so it was it was, it was through into publishing and it was a, a we, they do publications for high-end communities for the families itself so I started that publication. It was advertising, getting stories. And, it was, and honestly, I did it as a way to connect with my neighbors. And it, and it definitely helped me do that. But it was it was awesome. I did that for about three years. And there was different things within the company that I wasn't, it didn't really align with where I wanted to go. Because I was like, you know what? I want to do more of the consulting and the coaching. Now, there were promises within the company that they wanted me to do that. And they told me that they wanted to. But then after a couple of years, they never allowed it to. So I said, screw it. I'm going to do my own thing. And so I had the publication and then I learned a, a skill set on how to build sales funnels. And I had a coach that I had at the time, you know, see one of my funnels after I implemented some of the strategy that he told me. Uh, and he was like, who built your funnel? He's like, I told him, I was like, well, it was me. And, and he was like, man, you need to start doing this for people. I said, people don't buy stuff like this. Why would they buy a sales funnel? That, that's easy. Like to me, the creative design and everything like that was easy. It didn't, it, it came very natural to me but I didn't realize people bought for it. So I tried it and I was like, okay, well, let me try one client. So I sold my first one for $500. So I did like two of them like that, but they didn't even blink an eye. They're like, oh yeah, do it, 500 bucks. Then I got, I was like, okay, let me bump it up to 750 for the next one. Then let me bump it up to a thousand. And then people just kept saying yes. And I, you have to understand at this time, I didn't even think making $2,000 a month online was even possible. Then all of a sudden after a few months, I was making 50 to $100,000 months Mm -hmm. by building sales funnels and consulting so it, it was just it really opened up my eyes to a whole different world i was like wow maybe there's something here but then i've always had a passion for wanting to help and do consulting so i had two separate businesses so i had the fran the publication franchise then i started building funnels for people but then i was doing consulting as well so at the moment i had three different businesses that i was building and i ended up letting the publication go um it, so i could focus on on my stuff and then started building my consulting business that was separate from my funnel business then after a couple of years, I was like, you know what? I'm spending more time consulting the people that I'm building these funnels for than I am actually building their assets because most of them don't understand what their mission is, what their message is, what their offers are, what they even want to do. And I'm having to take them through this whole process. And I was like, you know, screw it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to combine it and create one business, which brings me to Creed Consulting. And I started Creed Consulting when I combined it all in 2019. I started funnels and consulting in 2017. But then combine them both in 2019 and went full time in 2019 with the business that I have today. Beautiful. So Creed Consulting, that's an excellent thing because like mine, I my yeah, my show is Crush and Mountain. That's an acronym. And Creed likewise is an acronym. And so could you tell us what Creed stands for and how it helps others and um, what you the things you've learned by once you look up the meaning of the word? Yeah, totally. So when I was thinking about putting together the name, you know, my consulting business before that was called 100K Fit Pro. I was originally only helping fitness coaches and things like that. So I call 100K Fit Pro, you know, every, from the fitness standpoint, most entrepreneurs, they're always like, I want to hit 100K for whatever reason. That milestone is what everyone wants to hit. And I'm like, okay, so you want to make $8,333 a month. I'm like, huh? When I say you want to make 100K, so you want to make that. He's like, no, I want to make 10K a month. Okay, well, 10K a month is $120,000 a year. But they don't, they just don't do the math. They just have that, that mindset. So that's the reason why I, my business was 100K Fit Pro at the time. Mm -hmm. And then my mm -hmm. funnel business was Fit Pro Funnels. And I built that thing to be crazy, it was crazy good. But I didn't want, when I was thinking about like a name to combine it all, I didn't want like something that was tied to money. Like a lot of coaching businesses was always like six figure mastermind, seven figure coach, seven figure mastermind, all these different things. And to me, that didn't settle well because I really wanted to come a place of servant of serving and, and, and versus transactional. And to me, it just didn't feel good. So when I was, when I, when I was trying to think of a name, I, I, you know, got a piece of paper out and I started thinking about 
all the different character traits I wanted for myself. So more accountability is like, okay, for me to build the business, what do I need to do to make it sure that I'm successful? So taking back my martial arts and taking back from the military, I started writing a bunch of things like commitment, resilient, excellence, like in the martial arts, we're talking about having black belt excellence and then having discipline and execution for taking action and all these different things. And I was like, and I started looking at the paper and I was like, oh man, this is really cool. And I started putting pieces together. I was like, hey, Creed, you know, this is what it is. And it, which stands for commitment, resilience, excellence, execution, and discipline. Mm -hmm. And it's an acronym that, that I look at as more of my core values, but also, also my ethos and something that keep pushes me to make sure I'm doing better, but also for our clients. And when, after I put it together and I'm already running with the name for a while and I'm trying to rebrand myself and things like that, I actually looked up what the name Creed stood for and it stands for belief. So right. if you look by Wikipedia, the definition of creed is belief and it even goes even deeper. So like my podcast show, is called the daily creed podcast show. My business is called creed consulting, but the biggest question that I ask anyone that I interview or even our clients is what is the one thing that you're most committed to? And they're going to be resilient, even through the most difficult times, they're going to show up every single day, giving your best, having excellence and having the emotional and physical discipline to complete your mission what is your creed because it's a question that because of who you are but because the one thing that the, the biggest reason why most businesses or entrepreneurs fail is commitment people mm -hmm. don't stick with something long enough to even see it out to see to, to see if it's going to be successful that's perfect because something gets hard and they want to quit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's so perfect so that's so perfect. Yeah. I'll tell you why. Because see, now with me, with you know, with the crush method, that first C is first conceive and then commit. Okay. And I have to throw in a third C in there somewhere along the because it really it really takes a lot of courage. But yeah, yeah, you know, the first thing you have to do is have an idea and then you have to commit to it. And mm -hmm. then you have to keep going. So I love that. You know, we're kind of a, you know, two peas in a pod in that sense, you know? So yeah. talk to me more about how you utilize the Creed method to help your clients move forward and to reach their goals. Yeah, it, honestly, it's, it's kind of a reminder. Anytime I get a new client in the onboarding process, I go through, it's like, hey, this is the Creed. And I make them tell me and go through the first process of our foundations, which is the mission of understanding what is their purpose, what's their identity, but what's also their destination. And then I talk about the creed and getting them to commit to what they're going to go through. And I explain to them, be like, hey, building the, be building the business is easy, but it's also hard. So it's easy to build a business, but it takes that commitment. It takes resilience. It takes the discipline. And you have to commit to these processes to do it. So it's a constant reminder, even for our clients saying, hey, are you committed? Are you going to do this? Are you committed to the process? Are you committed to me and showing you all how to do it? Are you going to go out there and watch every single dangling golden carrot and follow any process that comes your way? Because mm -hmm. if you're committed, you're going to push through and you're going to show up. Like I, I get, I, I'm, I'm really hard on my clients. And if I get show up on a coaching call and you didn't complete your marching orders, I'm going to look at them and be like, well, guess what? You're doing the same thing that I told you to do two weeks ago. And then they can't, they can't get mad at me for not, for not moving them along. If they want to move their business along, they got to commit to it. They got to show up every day. And it's not just being mediocre. It's about giving your best at all times. Right, right. But right. that commitment is the most important part. And then understanding that you have to be resilient because you are going to have difficult times. You are going to have days when you're going to get ambushed, which is why I always try to tell people, because we're all going to get ambushed inside of our businesses and our personal life, just like I got ambushed when I got blown up by the suicide bomber at the walking checkpoint. But we're all going to get ambushed sometime in our life. And we got to make sure that we're committed to the process and going to push through and make sure that we're ready for the ambush when it comes. Let's talk a little bit about self-sabotage because I find that that is the one top thing that individuals would be ambushed by, you see. Uh, now my thing, I work with individuals with weight loss and, di and diabetes reversal, uh, as well as creating a path in life. And so what happens is, especially when it comes to the weight loss aspect, there's a point where the, the, the um, the little sugar demon takes over. Somewhere along the line, they're, 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 they start thinking differently. And they say, well, well, I've been good for a while. I have this little thing. But when they move there, then it's just all over for them many times. Mm -hmm. 
okay? Because they become discouraged, they give into a little bit of self-loathing, and then they and then they um, and, and they kind of want to give up. So when you come across your clients that are now self-sabotaging, how do you help them? It depends on what where they're self-sabotaging themselves. I mean, first off, when when it comes to looking for a good coach, you also want to find a coach that's actually gone through the stuff themselves. Right. Because you can't you can't have a coach that's, that doesn't know how to get through the trials and tribulations or the difficult times because how are they going to coach you through those different times? Right. I can't tell you majority of the issues my clients have gone through, I have gone through myself. And I've been able to steer them through that process. So for me, when it, whenever it's come self-sabotage, you know, a lot of it, and I hate the word mindset because it's overused, but truthfully, it's a lot of the mindset and your belief of what you're even going through and what you're doing. And I'm always reminded by second Timothy saying, we shall not live in a spirit of fear, but in power, love and sound mind. Right. And you know, it's the enemy that brings that fear. I and mean, we all go through it sometimes. And like, I, I had a client today uh, that, that I'm talking to and she's, She's going through a really difficult time. She actually does t-shirt embroidery and a bunch of knickknacks for people, but her two main printers that does all the engraving and printing and stuff like that are completely broken. And it's a 25,000 plus dollar machine and she has two different machines. Mm -hmm. And so she's calling me panicking and fears. Like, I don't know what to do. I can't pay this. I can't pay that. And I'm behind on all these different things. I said, well, what can you do? What, what do you have exposed? What do you, what skill sets do you have that we can get you going so you can start building another revenue. And after about an hour of conversation, I was going through a bunch of different things. And I was like, you know what, you got a really great skill set on, on, on graphics designing. Uh, she's super creative on that. Why don't you start doing this, you know, on social postings and things like that as a VA social media manager for other businesses and gain some reoccurring revenue. And then a light bulb went off and now her fire's back on. So to me, I am really good, a great skill set. And you want to call it like a, you know, a power that I got. I'm really good at seeing a bunch of different pieces and pictures and put and glue them together to make one beautiful picture and then how to make that system run. So for when I, when you talk about self-sabotage and how I work through my clients, well, first off, I just, I'm not the easy coach. I'm not the one that's just going to sit back and saying, Hey, you know what? It's okay. Let me rub your back for you. It's like, well, I told her straight up. I was like, well, you need, you need to get your act straight and start doing, doing something because there are things that she could have done to prevent for different things, but she just chooses not to. And then we started working through and talking through the different process. But I try to be that soundboard and I try to make sure that, hey, let's figure out what you can do, not what you can't control. And then figure out the process from there. But everything starts here. I always take them back to their why. I always take them back to the purpose. I always take them back to who they are and, and remind them of their wins and their beliefs and what they're great at. And then I bring them back to what, what they need to do to help get them moving forward. Absolutely. You know, one of the challenges that people have is, is they hit that wall and then they experience some sort of an emotional pain because they hit that wall, okay? They're hitting an emotional wall, a, a psychic wall, but then there's the emotional pain that comes up as a result of that. It could be from past trauma. It could be just from a sense of, not, of, of, of guilt for not following through. But many times what we have to do is we have to sit with them and work with them. Now, myself, I have certain techniques that I utilize. I help them to identify that pain, isolate that pain, and literally within minutes, reduce the, the pain. And I teach my clients that so that they can move forward. In fact, I had one who came in, he was really flustered, he had an argument with his wife. In fact, when he came to see me, he parked in the wrong spot, you know, he was so upset. and. He actually had to move his car over and get back to where he needs to be. And he sat with me for a little bit. And the process of that day was teaching him a way of focusing on the pain, but understanding the good intention behind it. Mm -hmm. And then taking it and working with it so that it now serves him. And it's no longer a pain, but the pain is gone. But the awareness of what he needs to do is present and he can move forward. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I love working with individuals in that manner because it's nice to see how they, they kind of blossom, so to speak. They kind of move away from the challenges. I do a lot of um, uh, visualization techniques that way. So with mm. you yourself, I noticed that, you know, you, you have that strength of that's kind of both the martial art and martial or military 
way of handling things, you know. And the truth is, we, uh, sometimes and oftentimes, your client needs a good swift kick in the butt to get yeah. what you're doing, right? You know, now you also do have some speaking engagements from time to time. Um, you know, do you have your TED Talk coming up and, and, and where can we do it? I know you said you have a, a daily podcast. How long does it last? Tell us about your guests and things like that. Or how, what do you do? Speaking. Yeah, I don't have a TED Talk, uh, you know, scheduled, but it is something in my pipeline that I want to be able to, to get going. But I do a lot of different speaking engagements and workshops and and uh, different things across the country uh, all the time and sharing different things. Like one is unlocking the secrets to attracting your perfect client. They're not your message, the problems that you solve as well as putting together your offer and how to utilize that to your benefit to serve others, but also to grow your pipeline. Uh, so there's that. I usually, whenever I'm doing some speaking, I'll speak on sales, marketing, legion, and leadership. And then even time management on how to like own your day and going through like our process when it comes to that. So those are a lot of the main topics that I do and when it comes to speaking on stages or leading workshops and things on, on that order. Um, when it comes to like my business itself, of course, our business name is Creek Consulting. And then my podcast is called The Daily Creek Podcast Show. And the goal of my podcast, honestly, I love interviewing small business owners that are making an impact to help other entrepreneurs. So typically someone that has a story that led them to where they're at and they have to be someone, an entrepreneur, but they have to be an entrepreneur and someone making an impact to help uh, help their community in some way. And then typically they will offer a tip or strategy that our audience can walk away and implement right away within their business and uh, help them grow. So uh, I've been active in my podcast for probably two, two and a half years now. I have close to a hundred episodes and it's been, it's been going pretty strong. And I, 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 I use it as a way, honestly, for therapeutic for me to just kind of open up, share my story, but connecting and growing relationships. And that's been one of the fastest ways for me to honestly grow my network, but also build some really cool relationships with people. Yeah, that is really a, a nice way of doing it. I love doing it. I love connecting with folks this way as well. One of the things I've got to ask you, because you mentioned it a couple of times, because we have this in common. Okay. So my question to you next is what guitar do you have? What kind of guitar? Yeah. Oh man, I got, I actually have five guitars. Five. Um, so, but, yeah, but my baby is a, a tailor. So I, so when I came back from Iraq, I, uh, I wanted to, I'm an acoustic player. So <laughs> I, when I came back from Iraq, I used a lot of that money that I saved up for to buy me that guitar. And that's my stage guitar. So only when I perform in front of people and on mm -hmm. stages, other than that, it stays in the case protected and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have an Alvarez, I have a school, Wire, I have a Fender um, in my in my tailor, and then I have a Seagull. Cool. Now, mine is um, I have a, a Yamaha. I forget the actual um, the, the actual um, designation of, of it. It's an electro acoustic guitar. That's 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 the the baby I play with the most. And I have a classic 1962 Guild. This okay. Um, with the it's complete with the, the, the f holes hollow body um and that that's that's my other baby that's 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 um that's the old lady that, that that's that i have my, my wife is not an old lady she'll never be the only old lady to me but my guitar that's the old lady because she was she was around long before i was born you know that's and, awesome. uh, and man this the uh the, the strings especially the first four uh, the, you know, the, the base E going up is so smooth. It's so smooth. Mm. Man. It's, it's so easy to, 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 to play and mess with. Do you do so, you know, no doubt you do a lot of Christian bass music, but do you, um, do you do some impressionistic jazz type of stuff? Do you do, are you a Wyndham Hill guy or, or, or what? You know, it's a funny story that you mentioned that because I picked up the play. I, I played music ever since I was a little kid, but I didn't pick up the guitar until 2004 when I was in the military. Mm. Um, and I only I only learned how to play the guitar for one reason, and that's to worship. And for me, like, I don't see any other reason to play music for me, myself other than worship. If I have time to play music, it's there to be in the presence of God. And that's where I where I do it. And so I, I'm always in my own prayer closet. That's where I spend my time in worship. And that's that's where I, why I picked up and why I still continue to play. I just never had a desire to learn any other style or any other music. I mean, I'll, I'll play around with like little blues chords and things like that here and there. But other than that, you know, to me, I picked up the guitar for worship and I continue to play for worship. 
because that's a gift that he gave me to do and and that's what i and that's what i'll i'll do to even lead other people in that's pretty amazing i'll tell you with me um i play and occasionally and it's really a, i'm not a performer years ago i used to uh, when i was working in the healthcare field and i was dealing with nursing homes i would take my guitar there and do stuff but it's very much the david little david under the stars type of thing you know if if, yeah. if if you if i can get to a place of nature and you've been in the carolinas so you know about the mountains and you know about the beach and both of those areas especially certain times of day are just perfect for that <clears throat> musical communication with god mm -hmm. so i really have to you know you know again you kind of see that eye to eye on that you know because yeah. that's essentially you said psalm 91 and here's the interesting thing about the psalms people don't realize this okay and if you read um in the scriptures we were just we, our congregation is actually doing a um, progressive study of the bible and reading of the bible and we're in second samuel's fourth if we're in our fourth or six perfect thing they it, it talks about david celebrating the ark and how mm -hmm. he was dancing with all of his might that tells you that the music of ancient of the ancient Hebrews and Israelites had a lot of rhythm to it, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes we lose that a little bit, you know, but the most important thing is having the music there and to share in your heart with God, you know, yeah. it's a great thing. Well, listen, I'll ask you this, Mr. J.R. Spirits, you have been a tremendous individual from your experience in the military, overcoming the challenges of that, the things that you still carry with you, that you that you combat day to day because you have your own personal war. You have your you, you have successfully created businesses and helped others to do the same. I must ask you as our last question, J.R. Spears, what does it mean for you to crush your mountain? Yeah, so it's it's almost like the creed and the purpose and what, what to do. So for me, I have one. I let, let me take. I'm going to take a step back because I've always helped. I've helped hundreds and hundreds and probably close to a thousand people and entrepreneurs really figure out their identity, their own purpose. And and yet it was always really struggling. That felt good to me. I always had like the superficial stuff that I would say like this is who I am. And then it wasn't until probably six months or maybe eight months ago I woke up. I like popped out of bed, had a light bulb moment, and it was really clear. And my commitment, my creed, my crush it, my reason, my why, honestly, is my family. And I, I, I say it in a, I say it very specifically, it's making sure that I'm leading my family to the cross. That's my mission. That's my, that's my purpose. And that's what I would do to crush it. So as long as I'm doing something to help my kids and my wife and lead them to the cross, then I know I'm doing what God's called me to do. Well, I want to thank you so very much for being with us today. I know that you gave a ton of information, a ton of, uh, a, a lot of a wealth, well, well, a wealth of information to our listeners, to our watchers. And again, friends, I just want you to keep in mind that regardless of the circumstances that you are in, no matter what you may be facing in life, keep in mind that you are able to overcome your challenges you're able to overcome the mountains that we face my belief is climbing a mountain can have its merits but more importantly being determined to get through the tunnels that we face daily and doing what we can in order to see the light at the end of the tunnel get through the other side so I want to encourage everyone that uh, I keep calling you Dr. Spears. I deal with a lot of doctors. Okay. They'll just make you a doctor. Just, just honor that. Okay. Where can we reach you if we need to get up, uh, get up with you? Yeah. So they can visit my website, which is just www.jrspear. And that's S sincere, P as in Papa, E as in Echo, Alpha, A as in Alpha, R as in Romeo dot com so jrspear.com and then on there they'll be able to connect with me get on my my social sites and things like that facebook is my home but uh, my website is the best place to connect 
Excellent. So we'll look forward to touching base with you again further and to see how, how much you um, continue to grow in your journey. And I want to invite all of you friends to tune in next week. We'll have another guest with us. And in the meantime, as I always say, don't just climb a mountain, crush through it. And we'll see you next time. Thank you so very much, JR. Thank you. Appreciate it. Right. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. You see how important it is that we understand what's going on with each individual. This is Mental Health Month. It's the last couple of days before the month ends, but it's so important to keep in mind all individuals who are dealing with traumas such as J.R. Spears and others, perhaps those who do not have the resilience that he had. Guess what? You can get the resilience if you have a counselor, if you have a coach, if you have a therapist, individuals that can move you from the past to the present, and then from the present to your glorious future. I am Henry Gaskins, also known as the Hankster G, and you know what I always say, don't just climb your mountain, crush through it. We'll see you next time.